Okay, so good morning, everyone. I've been sitting here over the past 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes taking this, and now it's my time to respond. Um, so basically, this is what we're dealing with. Additional medical therapy, endoscopic dilatation, or us. And I've always thought, and from football, basically the best uh, defense is a good offense. So let's look first at the role of medical therapy in this. You know, as a surgeon, we look at this. We're obviously not medical doctors, but we look at this and we say, you know what? You know, there's proximal dilatation. Presumably, the patient's symptomatic. This stuff is expensive. You're going to start adding on anti-TNF agents, potentially steroids, lifetime exposure. When do you stop? Do patients really get better? No one's really looked at the quality of life in these partial responders. Many of these patients, yeah, they get a little better, but are they really better? Okay. And then many of these patients are put on IV steroids. There's some treat registry data to suggest that if you actually initiate steroids in this situation, that you're actually inducing a stenosis. And remember, if actually many of these patients end up in surgery, has been reported many, many times, and actually mentioned at this conference as well, steroids are a big determinant of postoperative morbidity. So if they're already potentially on the way to the operating room, you clearly are not doing your patient a service by giving them steroids or potentially even more aggressive therapy in the role of TNFs, because that clearly increases surgical morbidity in Crohn's patients. We also look at this as, you know, as surgeons, we look at this pre-stenotic dilatation as a negative prognostic factor because it's a sign of, of severe disease. Now, how do we know this? I actually read about, which I actually never knew about, there's something called the Lehman score, which actually is being developed now. It's actually looking very much, it's very akin to the way that uh, some scores are being done in, in RA to actually look at the effect of these uh, 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 processes on the, on the body itself, structural damage. And this is a longitudinal tool that's currently being developed. But if you actually look at one of the parameters that they have, stricture with pre-stenotic dilatation. What we're specifically talking about here is stricture with a pre-stenotic dilatation. We're not talking just about strictures themselves. So obviously this implies this must be a pretty bad disease if people are looking at it. And also, there's been some data that looked at this specifically. This is actually a group of patients that actually were looked at prospectively using uh, findings at MR to actually suggest which of the patients responded to medical therapy or not. And you can see in the patients with no stenosis, fairly good improvement. Stenosis with no dilatation, less. But look at the stenosis with proximal dilatation. About a quarter of the patients getting better. Look at that odds ratio at the bottom, almost eight. So basically, in this particular scenario, the medical therapy that you think you're giving to actually make this patient better, you have a fairly low chance that it's actually going to work. So then I actually look, you know, I'm a surgeon. Maybe the gastroenterologists have some good ideas, and I'm certainly not an expert gastroenterologist, but these people are. This is the European panel of the appropriateness of Crohn's disease therapy, which has some, if you've ever, ever looked at the site, it's actually a very cool site. It's an online site. You can put in parameters, et cetera but it, of the patients to basically guide therapy. But one of the things that they look at specifically here is if you look at the patients who have these disease location in the small bowel with a stenosis, if it's less than seven centimeters, their proposed treatment is endoscopic dilatation, strictureplasty, or bowel resection. Everything in purple is medical therapy and is, and is in, inappropriate, okay? This is medical therapy for pre-stenotic dilatation. This is not from me, this is from you guys. These are from experts in gastroenterology. What about if the stricture is a little bit longer? In that situation, nothing is recommended, particularly over seven centimeters I'm talking about. Nothing is recommended except strictureplasty or bowel resection. So my point is this is actually not even surgery. This is you guys that are actually saying that these patients should go to surgery. I think that's very profound data suggesting that medical therapy is not indicated in this situation, which actually is interesting because if you look at the survey at the beginning, almost over half of you actually thought that medical therapy was the way to go. Now, what about the iliocolic resection? This is, I guess, what we're referring to, particularly in this situation. The iliocolic resection that you know now, and I think all of you know this in clinical practice, is not the iliocolic resection that you knew 10 years ago. With laparoscopy now, there's minimal scarring, enhanced cosmesis. These patients generally do well. Fast restoration of quality of life. We know a month after, after surgery, these patients wish they had the surgery a long time ago. They feel great. Okay? Complications are very low. The medications that they're on obviously can be stopped. They're obviously limited if they're going to be pro in the prophylactic mode. And the small bowel loss, particularly in this clinical scenario which we were given with a short stricture, is a fairly low amount. That's 20 to 25 centimeters. That's less than a foot. That's not inches. So the point is that it's a very small amount of bowel that's, that's removed. And what about long-term uh, long, uh, long -term outcomes? Obviously, in addition to not a midline big scar that we used to see, laparoscopy is associated with lower incisional hernias and probably less adhesions, which most likely in the future, although it's never been proven yet, will result in less small, adhesive small bowel obstruction. 
So Bo has actually been trying to tell you that potentially endoscopic dilatation is a way to go. But let's just compare this for a second. Average procedure length, most of the patients, most of the patients who have endoscopic dilatation, the procedures can, are usually pretty quick because most of them are, at least in this clinical scenario, in the terminal ilium. But compared to laparoscopic surgery, about 120 minutes or so, some actually strictures, particularly in the mid-small bowel, can actually be very difficult to get to. What about overall complications rate, complication rates? Less than 10% of laparoscopy. Maybe in the Cleveland Clinic, when they're actually being done with Bo and his group, they're actually very low. But it is about a 10% reported rate across the world. This is reported data. It's not just the Cleveland Clinic. Complications requiring surgery, about 5%. Less than 1% with laparoscopic surgery, if it's actually done in expert hands. Peritonitis perforation equivalent between both endoscopic and laparoscopic surgery. And although it's uncommon, there's potentially the cancer in that segment, obviously surgery will remove the section. If you're dilating a cancer, that's actually not very good. And what about, <laughs> this is the most profound slide, at least as surgeons, we look at this and we say this should be really the way to go. Technical success rate, obviously laparoscopic surgery that removes the stricture, that's obviously 100% successful. Endoscopic dilatation, the technical success rate is 90%, but the clinical success rate, how well the patients do, is only about 50%. Surgery. We have well over 95% of our patients who a month post-op are feeling great. They are doing well. They have a little scar. They're basically starting at that point to discuss what they're going to do for prophylaxis, but they're basically feeling well. And the other thing that we as surgeons do is we take care of this at one time, okay? 99% of our patients need us at one time. There are rare times that they need to go back in with ileostomies, et cetera. Bas patients who have endoscopic dilatation, about 30% of the patients only require one procedure. The other 70% have to go back again the mean number of procedures needed to actually gain clinical success is four. We do it in one in general, okay? And the quality of life after the procedure, as mentioned before, after laparoscopic surgery is very high. No one really knows, quite frankly, what the QOL is after patients who've had endoscopic dilatation. So this is the way I like to think about it. It's just beating a dead horse. Surgery is the way to go. Laparoscopic ilocolic resections nowadays are fairly straightforward. They're, quite frankly, as a surgeon, they're one of the easiest procedures that we do, and the patients will feel well and thank you in, in the future. However, I can also agree that endoscopic dilatation is preferable over surgery in certain clinical scenarios. Multicentric disease, multiple prior resections, adhesions, where potentially there's going to be a difficult surgery. Obviously, loss of bowel with short bowel syndrome, but the poor surgical risk, if the initial presentation of disease, sometimes patients aren't, quite frankly, psychologically ready to have surgery, and the stricture location, gastroduodenal erectile sigmoid strictures should probably be dilated first because the surgical uh, uh, outcomes of those, potentially for colostomies and duodenal uh, bypasses, et cetera, are not necessarily the best for the patient. Thank you. Thank you.